If you're ever at a bank and see someone walking with a ski mask, your heart is sure to drop. I'm your host, Michaela, and today I'm talking about the top 10 of the biggest heists in history. And make sure to subscribe and hit that bell so you know every time we upload a new video. But now, let's get started. Starting off this counted at number 10, Northern Bank Robbery. On Sunday, December 19th, 2004, two groups of armed men stormed into the homes of two different employees of the Northern Bank. Both of the employees, Chris Ward and Kevin McMullen, were taken from their homes to the bank. Their families were held hostage and the robbers told Ward and McMullen to continue work as usual throughout the next day. The robbers kept in contact with the two via mobile phones and had the two steal $35.7 million after the bank had closed. They also forced Ward to transport $1.4 million to them at a bus stop during work hours. No one was ever charged with the crime itself, although two people convicted of laundering some of the stolen money were jailed. Ward, the innocent employee thus in the middle of the whole thing, seemed to get the worst of it. He was put on trial on suspicion of being in on the job, and it took four years to clear his name entirely. Number 9, Dressed and Green Vault Heist Located inside the Dresden Castle in Dresden, Germany, the Green Vault Museum holds the largest treasure collections in Europe and items that date back to the 16th century. In the early hours of Monday morning on November 25, 2019, thieves set a fire at an electrical distribution point nearby, cutting the museum's power and turning the area dark. Immediately, thieves smashed through a small corner window near the museum's historic jewelry collection. Ten rooms with about 3,000 items of jewelry and other recognized masterpieces. Wearing headlamps, they smashed glass and stole priceless jewels. It's not not, however, entirely clear how much those are worth. Initial reports said $1.2 billion, while later reports say the item's value had fallen short of that billion dollar figure. The thieves were in and out very fast, as police were called to the museum not long after the initial break in. They fled the scene in an Audi A6 sedan, then lit it on fire in an underground parking lot, presumably jumping to another getaway vehicle. Number 8 The Dunbar Armed Robbery Alan Pace masterminded the heist while he was working for Dunbar as a safety inspector. During his time, he plotted out the facility's layouts its cameras and its guards. No one suspected him. He was a fun-loving guy on the surface. Pace had recruited five childhood friends to perform the heist. He plotted out exactly where and when he needed to step in the hallways to avoid the cameras in order to get to the vault. They had the codes and knew where to go, so they expertly waited and maneuvered around the building until they happened upon a camera they couldn't avoid. So they went and tied up the security guards. And they took the VCR tapes too. When it was all done, the crew loaded up a U-Haul with $18.9 million without firing a single shot. They would have gotten away with it, however, but two years Years later, one of the robbers gave a real estate broker a stack of marked bills, and that broker went to the police. Hill then cracked and named names. Only about $5 million of the stolen money, however, was ever recovered. Number 7 Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum Theft for over 20 years, the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum heist has fascinated and frustrated the FBI and the art world. In the early hours of March 18, 1990, two men disguised as police officers approached the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. The museum guards on duty that night were two young men. One of them, Rick Abbott, broke protocol and let the fake cops in through the employee entrance, believing that there had been a disturbance of some kind. While the thieves surveyed the grounds, they asked the guards who let them in if anyone else was in the museum. Abbott called his fellow guard, Randy Hestan, down. The thieves, who had not said they were thieves yet, then told Abbott to come from behind the desk to prove his identity because they might have a warrant for his arrest. It's worth noting that the museum, despite holding countless treasures of art, only had one single panic button, and it was at that desk. The thieves handcuffed Abbott, and when Hestand arrived, handcuffed him as well. Then the thieves announced they were there to rob the museum. And so they did. In 81 minutes, the two thieves stole 13 works of art. Then the thieves simply disappeared into the night, and none of the pieces have ever been found. Number 6, London Brinks Matt Gold Robbery Six thieves in Balaclavas broke into the Brinks Matt Warehouse at, at London's Heathrow Airport in 1983 and tied up the security guards. One of them, Anthony Black, worked with the robbers. Their goal was to steal $4 million from the vault. Instead, the thieves found around 7,000 gold bars. Within two hours, the job turned into the biggest gold heist in British history. The men slipped away in a van, buckling under the weight of $37 million in gold, diamonds, and cash, wishing the security guards a Merry Christmas as they drove off. The group had to melt down the pure ingots and mix the gold with copper and brass so the purity didn't create suspicion. It didn't take long for police to find Black and follow the gang's money trail. Not all the robbers were convicted, however, and most of the gold is still missing. Also, fun fact, one of the thieves reportedly named his two Rottweiler dogs Brinks and Matt. Halfway at number 5, the Seymour Train Robbery The Renault Gang was a group of outlaws that operated in the Midwestern United States for just four years, from 1865 to 1868. Prior to October 6, 1866, any train robbery that had occurred was when the train was stationary, like robbing a building. The Renault Gang changed all that. John Renault, Sim Renault, and Frank Sparks boarded an Ohio and Mississippi railway train at night. At that time, valuables were locked in an iron safe and watched by a railroad company employee, who was there to move the contents of each safe between various 
various stations. Three masked men burst into the rail car demanding the safe keys. The employee tried to say he only had a key to the smaller safe, which held considerably less cash and valuables. One of the robbers ripped the key from him and opened it. Inside, they found $18,000 in cash, some jewelry, and several small packages. The bigger safe couldn't be opened on the train, as the key would have to be opened by an Adams Express agent. But the big iron safe was on wheels, so the group shoved the box out of the moving train. Then they pulled the bell cord to signal an emergency stop. As the train slowed down, they jumped out and into the darkness. The big safe weighed far too heavy for the Renault gang to run away with it, however. And especially because the law would be coming. So they left the safe, and it's $38,000 behind. The Renault gang continued to terrorize various areas around India and Missouri, and four more trains before three of the men were caught attempting to rob a fifth train. After they were taken prisoner, a mob hanged them by a tree. Another three Renault gang members were then caught soon thereafter, and were similarly hanged from the same tree. The site is known as Hangman Crossing, Indiana. Number four, the Knightsbridge Security Deposit Robbery. Valerio Vissier, who was already wanted for more than 50 armed robberies in Italy, almost committed the perfect crime in London in 1987. He and an assistant walked into a bank and asked to rent a safe deposit box. When the men were shown to the vault, they pulled out guns and overpowered the bank manager and guards. After putting a closed sign on the bank door, they let in some friends, broke into as many of the safe deposit boxes as possible, and made off with millions in cash and valuables. Valerio fled to South America, but was eventually arrested when he returned to England to ship his Ferrari to his new home. Number three, the United California Bank Heist. In 1972, Emil Decino, a professional criminal from Ohio, assembled a gang of six robbers and flew them to California. They rented a townhouse and planned a heist on a bank where they had mistakenly heard President Richard Nixon and kept a multi-million dollar slush fund. The crew used dynamite to make their way into the vault, stole $30 million worth of cash and valuables, and fled after scrubbing down the townhouse. The cops eventually identified the robbers through a generous tip they'd given a taxi driver, and through fingerprints found on the inside of the townhome's dishwasher. Number two, the Hatton Garden job. It might not be one of the biggest heists in history, but it's certainly one of the greatest. The Hatton Garden robbers weren't your ordinary criminals either. Half of them were senior citizens, looking for one last score before cashing into the big casino in the sky. They had multiple names. The Guardian called them Diamond Weezers, while the French press dubbed them the Granddad's Gang. The thieves used an elevator shaft to reach the basement, where they forced open shutter doors and used a heavy duty drill to get into the vault, which was six and a half feet of reinforced concrete. Prior to the robbery, the gang's alarm expert tampered with the security system using a 2G mobile phone jammer to block the alarm signal. Once inside, they tore open about 70 deposit boxes. Initially, it was believed that $279.9 million was stolen, but that number has since dropped to $19 million. The heist was carried out by six elderly ringleaders, ranging from the late 50s to the late 70s. Another four people were also convicted in connection with the crime. Now, coming in at number one, the Central Bank of Iraq robbery. This robbery in Baghdad became one of the largest bank heists in history. The mastermind was none other than Iraq director Saddam Hussein. One day before the Iraq Iraq war began in 2003, he sent three large trucks to the central bank. He also sent his son with a handwritten note asking to withdraw nearly $1 billion to keep it from enemy hands. The money was loaded into vans and driven away. Most of the cash was recovered in the ensuing raids, but it doesn't end here. American soldiers also made off with hundreds of thousands of dollars for themselves and their families. 35 service members were then later caught. This list made me rethink my financial situation because today we're counting down the top 10 poorest royal families. Welcome back to The Rich Life. I'm your host, Cash Mooney. Before we dive in, as always, make sure to show us some love by subscribing and hitting that bell icon with full force. I'm going to first state that our comparison here is the royal family of Saudi Arabia, who had an estimated net worth of $1.4 trillion. Number 10 on this list is Queen Margaret II. She's the Queen of Denmark as well as Supreme Authority of the Church of Denmark. Born on the 16th of April in 1940, she has a net worth of $40 million according to sources online which lands her on this list. If she's considered poor, I'm fairly concerned for my future, but in comparison to the other royals, she isn't exactly most paid royal and uh, earns a lot of her income through grants from her citizens. She's still an active queen and still actively gets more rich, so maybe next year she'll get off this list. Atumfo Osei Tutu II is the king of his kingdom and comes in at number two with a staggering $10 million to his name. He has developed this income through literal gold mines within his country along with his company that provides mining equipment to multiple major mining companies in Ghana. Unfortunately, he's on this list, but he has found major success in his company and for his country, so numbers don't do justice to his story. He's helped build a better economy for Ghana with the use of his mining company, as Ghana has a large amount of gold. Fun fact, he worked in Toronto, Canada at an insurance company for four years. He returned to Ghana in 1989 where he started his company and soon became king. 
Now this next royal family on the list is difficult. Number 9, the House of Orange Nasui. This is the Dutch royal family and while their history is of the richest royalties, they are very secretive on their wealth. Unreliable sources have said that the Prince of the House of Orange has a net worth of 1.5 million, but the Dutch royals hide their wealth and anyone who knows about their income stays silent on the subject. Which to me means either they got a ton of money and would prefer not to lose it in taxes or they got none and they don't want to be considered poor. Either or, their silence is landing them on this list. I guess we'll never really know, but uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Adding to number 9 is number 8, King William Alexander, who is the King of the House of Orange. He uh, earns about $1.1 million as the King of Holland. The reason he's on this list is because again, their income may be low compared to the other royals and they might be hiding it. It is believed that they could have a secret fortune of $4.1 billion. They are very secretive royals and it makes you wonder if the poorest royals are a front for the money that they rest upon. Makes me curious, I wish I had hidden away millions, but King William is said to earn roughly 1.1 million dollars so hidden money or not it did land him a spot in this list this may be the most modest royal family in the world number seven house of oldenburg norway this norwegian family is still rich don't get me wrong but they are so humble about their fortune often they're seen riding public transit and dressing very casual for events and gatherings they even bring their kids to public school over being homeschooled they may be royal but they act like everyone else and i love to see it you can tell they have strong values, all whilst the king withholds a net worth of $30 million alongside Olympic trophies. What a true king at that. I put them at number 7 due to the fact that they may have the money to outspend the royalty above them, but they're humble and live an honest life. They don't flaunt their fortune, which is a very good quality to have. Number 6, King Philip. The King of Spain has recently released his net worth as the government pushed to start being more transparent with their residents. He's announced that his net worth is a shocking $2.1 million. I say that as if I have more, that to which I can assure you I don't, but it is significantly lower than the royalty listed above. I will note that most of these royal families possess significant inheritance along with assets and allowances. So he is still rich, he's just most likely releasing liquid income and not including assets and inheritance. But we'll never really know how much money he has. King Philip, if you do have some extra cash that you're hiding, uh, I promise no one will look in my bank account if you just want to keep it there. Number 5, King Tupa of Tonga. Tonga is a Polynesian kingdom with more than 170 islands in the South Pacific. Of the 170 islands, there are 45 that are inhabited. With a very small population of 108,000 people, Tonga is not large. Therefore, their royalty must not have a lot of money. Wrong! The Tonga king has an estimated $5 million net worth, which per capita is actually a large amount. Tonga also has a large poverty rate, which is due to the 24% of their land allowing them to grow crops. Maybe the king should uh, spread some love and boost their on me. But I mean, what do I know? I'm nowhere near having 5 mil. Unfortunately, because of Tonga's location, their economy struggles to thrive, and they make the majority of their income through tropical fruits and tourism, which seems to go right to their king. The number 4 spot goes to Luis Alfonso de Bourbon. The rich inheritance ruling over multiple European countries has come to an end with a small living bloodline and a new government form taking over. The head of the house has a net worth of 1.5 million, which is earth shattering compared to the riches the family possessed before. I'm sure he and his family are still doing alright though. I mean, at the end of the day, how many people can say they're royalty? Located in France, the monarchy has been overthrown and restored many times throughout history, so I can See where their money has gone. Luis is the head of the French portion of the House of Bourbon, but times are difficult for the monarch and it seems that they don't get the same respect other royalties do. Number 9, Tuatia Paki. He is the current king of Maori in New Zealand and has been since 2006. Finding information on his income and earnings is difficult, but after some digging it is stated he has a net worth of between 800k and $1 million. I mean, no complaints there as long as that money's still kicking around. At 67 years old, he had success within the throne, and I'm sure will keep his duties as long as possible. He recently denied a meeting between him and England's royals. That was nothing to do with the video, but it's a cool fact I learned while making the video, so I, I thought I'd share. Okay, number 10 is not royalty, I'll be transparent, but he's a great guy, so hear me out. The president of Uruguay, 
This president has the heart of a lion. He donates about 90% of his monthly salary, equivalent to $12,000 to charity. He explained in an interview that he lived a humble life up until being elected president and at his age finds no reason to change that. He said he's happy sitting on his farm with his dog and doesn't want anything to change. After donating his salary, he's left with roughly $775 a month. He donates to entrepreneurs and less fortunate of his country. He's quoted saying, poor is a mindset. I don't feel poor, but instead I have freedom. I think he's a major indicator that there are amazing people out there, like everyone who is subscribed to The Rich Life. 10 things King Charles inherited from the Queen. And make sure to subscribe because it really helps us out, but now let's get started. Starting off this countdown at number 10, problems. The ascension of King Charles III to the throne has reignited a debate over whether the royal family deserves a global role in the 21st century. No more so than in the 14th Commonwealth realms, where the British monarch remains the head of state. Hard questions about the place of a foreign king have been raised by the legacy of empire and slavery that have been intertwined with British royalty for centuries. And Republican movements from the Pacific to North America to the Caribbean will be deciding whether they should take advantage of the opportunity. Recent events including Barbados conversion to a republic in 2021 and the removal of Queen Elizabeth as its head of state have also contributed to a buildup that may now reach a peak, according to The Guardian. Although there are vocal Republicans in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, it seems like Jamaica will have to deal with the problem first. Not least because installing King Charles III could necessitate a constitutional referendum. Number 9. Duchy of Cornwall Long before he inherited his mother's empire, King Charles III created his own. Charles spent 50 years building his royal estate into a billion dollar portfolio. He's one of the most successful money makers in the royal family industry, while his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, primarily entrusted her responsibility for her portfolio to Charles. The development of the Duchy of Cornwall, a private estate, involved Charles in a far deeper way. King Charles III has built up a sizable group of experienced managers over the last 10 years who have almost doubled the value of profits in his portfolio. The iconic cricket stadium, the Oval, the luxuriant countryside in the south of England, coastal vacation rentals, office space in London, and a suburban grocery depot are all currently owned by the Duchy of Cornwall. The 130,000 acre real estate portfolio, which is almost the size of Chicago, and brings in millions of dollars annually in rental income, is customarily controlled by a duke or duchess, according to the New York Times. However, King Charles III will forfeit the Duchy of Cornwall. Prince William, the eldest son of Charles and the current successor to the throne, will get the Duchy, which was established in 1337 by Edward III for his son and heir, Prince Edward. Number 8. Wimbledon's Royal Box As the name suggests, the Royal Box on the center court at Wimbledon's is the best place to enjoy a game of tennis. The 74-seater box, which was built in 1992 and owned by Queen Elizabeth II, has been an entertainment spot for friends and guests, including the members of the royal family, political figures, and commercial partners who are allowed to sit on an invitation-only basis. The price of the tickets is not stated because, as I mentioned, it is invite-only, but it's estimated that they could probably cost around $700 per ticket, and King Charles can invite whoever he wants. Number 7. The Sovereign Grant The British royal family is traditionally supported by taxpayers' funds, following an agreement made by King George III in the late 18th century. The Sovereign Wealth Grant is a fixed annual payment that is paid to the royal family family from public funds. In 2021 and 2022, the value of the Sovereign Grant has been set at just over $100 million. These funds are used to cover a variety of the expenses of King Charles III and the rest of the royal family, including travel costs, security, and official engagements. The grant also helps fund the upkeep of royal residences such as Buckingham Palace. The Sovereign Grant is used to support the Queen and her family, as well as to pay the costs associated with the succession to the throne. Number 6. No Taxes And now, King Charles III will inherit the majority of the the late sovereign's personal assets in its entirety, without the British government receiving any compensation, according to the provisions signed into law by the then Prime Minister John Major in 1993. Inheritances handed from, quote, a sovereign to a sovereign are exempt from the 40% tax imposed on assets worth more than $380. However, there is much more at stake than $500 million inherited by King Charles III. Number 5. Swan Population Queen Elizabeth enjoyed all manner of historic perks thanks to her then position as monarch, but one of the most unusual is that she had the right to own any swan swimming in open waters throughout the United Kingdom. I could go to Wales or any part of England or Scotland and say, that swan belongs to Her Majesty and just take it. That would be it, says David Barber who holds the ancient title of Royal Swan Marker. So it's likely now that King Charles would inherit those swans as well. Number 4. The Future King Charles III is the oldest heir to the British throne, and some experts believe that the responsibilities and challenges of being head of state should prompt him to abdicate in favor of his son so that he can retire with honor, taking over the overwhelming inheritance left by his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. He has a window of time in which to rule the country, and now everyone is waiting to see what kind of sovereign he will be. 
According to some experts, one of the reasons for King Charles III to abdicate would be that he is not comfortable with the constraints of his role as monarch, particularly in expressing his personal views. The king is used to speaking his mind. The new monarch of the United Kingdom, a more polarizing figure than his mother, is expected to rekindle debate over the usefulness of the royal family in light of the current state of the nation. At the same time, King Charles III is expected to fill the void created by the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, an iconic figure across the globe known for her sense of duty and devotion to service. Number three, car collection. The queen made her presence known even by the vehicle she drove to reach various events and appointments. It started in 1944, when she joined the war effort as an 18-year-old princess. The queen's state fleet, comprising three Rolls Royces, three Daimlers, and two Bentleys, is kept at Buck House, alongside a few Volkswagen support cars, so there's a high chance that Charles will take ownership of these cars and drive them without a license, of course. Number two, the true royal riches. The monarch as an institution is in possession of royal riches that are worth an estimated value of $38 billion. All these will be given to King Charles III and trust. The assets include properties such as the Crown Estate, Buckingham Palace, the Duchy of Lancaster, the Duchy of Cornwall, Kensington Palace, and the Crown Estate Scotland. Also the Royal Collection of Art and Jewelry, as well as official residences and the Royal Archives. That makes it one of Europe's most prominent property empires, with a huge commercial interest in areas such as developing offshore wind power generation. King Charles III, who once married to the late Princess Diana, is not allowed to sell any of these assets, however. But the Royal Family receives 25% of profits from the Crown Estate. Charles's personal wealth, which according to Celebrity Net Worth is estimated to be worth $100 million, will be augmented by the riches of the late Queen Elizabeth. Prince Philip, Queen Elizabeth's late husband, left a more modest legacy worth approximately $11 million, which included a collection of about 3,000 works of art, most of which were given to relatives and friends, according to the Sunday Times. The Duchy of Lancaster is a private estate with business, agricultural, and residential properties owned by monarchs since the Middle Ages, in which Charles inherits as king. Number one, Wood Farm. One of the lesser known homes that Charles has acquired from the Queen is Wood Farm, which is located on the beautiful Sandringham Estate, but is separate from the main house. The late Prince Philip was very fond of the humble property, and is reportedly where he spent most of his time after retiring from public duties in August 2017, resigning separately from Her Majesty. The five-bedroom farmhouse is set within a picturesque corner of the stunning 600-acre estate, but it is rather low-key inside, far from the gilded grandeur of royal residences such as Buckingham Palace. The impressive estate is also home to Amher Hall, which is the country home for the Prince and Princess of Wales and their three children. But that is all. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.